Welcome to The Rational Live. I'm your host, David Dole. Uh, what was I going to say? I already forget. But uh, we have a good show today, or I have a good show today. I keep saying we because I, I don't know why, <laughs> but I'm literally the show. But uh, stuff, lots of fun stuff to go over today. Usually I try to make these these streams a little, um, I don't know, lighter or, or easier on myself by using a lot of clips. And I do have some clips in today's videos, but... These are deep stories, like <laughs> at least three of them are uh, substantial, three out of the four. So uh, yeah, let's, uh, let's, let's hope this all goes well. Um, but of course, if you want to support the show, you can go to therationalnational.com slash join. That's the Patreon page. You can also join on YouTube or send super chats in. I'll be taking super chats throughout the stream, of course. And uh, at the end of the stream, or near the end of the stories, I'll get to um, 
uh, all the super chats, anything I missed, and also some random chats that pop up. All right. Uh, I feel a little, I don't know, a little low energy today. I think I've just, uh, some weeks, like last week, I was full of energy, very excited. <laughs> this week, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to fake it, but uh, definitely exhausted. I'm definitely exhausted. That said, let me just make sure the stream is going well. All right, good. Everything seems fine. All right, uh, let me get into it. Oh yeah, I guess I'll give you a preview of what's coming up today. So Klobuchar, as I'll get to shortly, uh, I'll get to it shortly, so I'm not even gonna preview it, but it's a Klobuchar story. Also, I'll be getting to uh, Joe Biden and what he just admitted about the wage. Also, the Toronto Star does some anti-worker propaganda. I want to uh, discuss that, and it goes to a larger issue with how the media frames various stories. And also, Charlie Kirk, this is the one fun story I have this week. <laughs> Charlie Kirk fretting over Gen Z being the gayest generation. And I have a graph to uh, help to contextualize this story and help you understand maybe why it's the gayest generation. But let me get into it. So this first story is a, a Klobuchar story. I know it sounds boring, but I'm telling you, not boring. <laughs> this is actually one of the better stories. Senator Amy Klobuchar got confronted by a group of water protectors during a fundraising event. Check this out. Guys, could we just let me talk about Connie here just a little bit? Okay. Well, anyway, I just want to, I want to, okay, I want to thank everyone, tell you how much we love Connie Bernardi, okay? So let's get her reelected. All right, I'm going to get to more on line three in a minute here to tell you what that's all about. But uh, first, it's just this reaction, just to run away, not engage at all. It it doesn't make you look good. Now, that said, I'm not sure what she would even say <laughs> because she is in support of line three. She has no excuses to support that in the face of uh, the climate crisis. So maybe the best thing for her is to run away because if she engages she's not going to win that that debate but this is not new for her so apparently they protested her before and she had the exact same reaction this from uh, resist line three that posted the initial video saying here this isn't the first time that amy klobuchar has been confronted on her line three stance this has happened several times already what's remarkable is that every single time her response is to run away Senator, do you think this really, uh, do you really think this is a good look? Now, let's get into what line three is all about. So this is the map. You see uh, the, the pipeline here going through it all. So you got it right here, Minnesota. I'm going to read a bit here from um, MN th MN350.org, which is a site that details some of this information while I'm showing you this map here. So Line 3 was proposed in 2014 by Enbridge, a Canadian pipeline company responsible for the largest inland oil spill in the U.S. It uh, will have the capacity to carry nearly a million barrels of tar sands per day. And from, N, uh, from MN350.org, they say here, the pipeline route cuts through untouched wetlands and the treaty territories of the Anishinaabe people through the Mississippi headwaters and to the shores of Lake Superior. Now a little more here on line three 
Line 3 is a tar sands pipeline currently under construction in northern Minnesota, violating treaty rights, risking over 200 bodies of water with the threat of an oil spill, and reversing our progress on climate change with a carbon equivalent of 50 coal-fired power plants. Now, not only is it a is is it a threat uh, of an oil spill, my understanding is essentially every pipeline in North America has spilled oil at some point, and it happens all the time. But in the process of them building this pipeline, there have been leakages of the fluid that is used to build the pipeline. So this is from Global News headline here, Minnesota regulator reports new spills along Line 3 construction route. Now, the fluid that was le- that was uh, leaked is not as, you know, it's, it's not oil, uh, but it does have an impact on uh, aquatic life in the area. So it's still something that they're supposed to be uh, regulating for or, or ensuring does not happen. But it shows you just the, the reckless approach, Enbridge's reckless approach here to just building the pipeline, let alone once the pipeline is built, expect more uh, actual oil spills. Now, this is a... So this is a, a larger project that's being built to replace an older pipeline just as we move away from fossil fuels. So, like, the the whole... If we're going to really take the climate crisis seriously... When you have a pipeline like the old one that is going out of commission, the idea to right now in 2021 build a new pipeline, invest into more fossil fuel infrastructure as we need to move away from fossil fuels, it shows you that the people in charge are not are not really serious about dealing with the climate crisis. Now, I'm going to give you just a couple of uh, resources here if you want to learn a lot more on this. So stopline3.org, this page here. You'll find uh, more information as well as mn350.org that I quoted as well. And I'll link to those below the video. All right. There you go. Klobuchar getting heckled. Always fun to see. (laughs) By the way, I should have mentioned. It was just funny. It looks like she's doing like a stand-up special here. I don't know. I don't know what venue this is. Maybe it was a comedy club. Um, But, you know, she's trying her hand at at her uh, hilarious jokes. What's that one she always does about Donald Trump? About a blizzard and, and his hair? How does your hair fare in a blizzard? Maybe she t- discussed that one or, or told that joke up there. I don't know. <laughs> it's just a, it's a weird venue to see uh, Klobuchar at. All right. Uh, I'm going to prep the next story and I'll be right back. <laughs> back. If you've noticed, longtime viewers may notice, I have finally turned down the uh, the music during the breaks. <laughs> Some people complained about it. It was, it was too loud. When I went to change it, I noticed it, it was already brought down. So I guess at some point, you know, probably a year ago or, or more than that, uh, I had brought it down, but I guess it was still too loud. But hopefully now it's at a good level. Let me know if it's still too loud. But I think uh, I brought it down to a place that is a little more acceptable to the ears. All right, here we go. Joe Biden making a big admission. During a speech on the infrastructure bill, President Joe Biden called for good-paying union jobs and in the process admitted 
that $15 an hour isn't enough to raise a family. Check this out. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to create good paying union jobs, union, not good job, not $12 an hour, not $15 an hour, 45 bucks an hour and up with good benefits. So you can raise a family on and build the middle class out and jobs. It cannot be outsourced. It can't outsource these jobs. All right. Now, in a minute, I'm going to get to an FDR quote showing you what the intention of the minimum wage was. But first, of course, of course, you can't raise a family on 15 bucks an hour. We all know this or we should know this. But seeing Joe Biden admit this does raise a couple questions. First, he didn't care enough to even raise the wage to 15 bucks an hour when he could have gotten rid of the uh, the parliamentarian in the initial spending package at the beginning of the year to be able to pass the wage increase. But secondly, if he's aware of this, then why isn't he fighting to raise the minimum wage even higher? Again, if he understands what the intention of the minimum wage actually is. So the argument against it generally has been that, well, teens work those jobs, not you know people raising their family, but that's not true. So first of all, it implies that teens don't or teens are in a position where, where they get to keep all that cash oftentimes they, they have to work to help their family but secondly it, it this idea that teens mostly work these these low-wage jobs is just not true when looking at the actual data so this is from the economic policy institute and this uh has been referenced by a number of outlets including the new york times that also used those uh, same figures but they show here in this infographic what people think. So teenager works part time after school, lives with parents, earning extra spending money. But the reality is that the average age of a minimum wage worker is 35 years old. 88% are not teens. They are 20 or older. 36% are 40 or older. 56% are women. 28% have children. 55% work full time. And on average, they earn half of their family's total income. So we are talking about adults here that are trying to raise a family on what is, I mean, at this point, <laughs> this is an, an article from 2013, these figures, the wage still hasn't increased. So it, the idea that we're still fighting for 15 is actually antiquated. We should be fighting for a lot more at this point because 15 bucks an hour, you know, maybe back in 2012, 2011, 2010 would have made more sense. But now we're 10 years out Clearly, it needs to be increased a lot more. Now, on the issue of uh, the whole purpose of the minimum wage. So it is very clear that it was always meant to be a living wage. So this is a quote from, from FDR, uh, from a speech made on June 16th, 1933, on the National Industrial Recovery Act, which included a provision for the minimum wage. So he says here, Quote, no business which depends for existence on paying less than living wages to its workers has any right to continue in this country. By business, I mean the whole of commerce as well as the whole of industry. By workers, I mean all workers, the white collar class as well as the men in overalls. And by living wages, I mean more than a bare subsistence level. I mean the wages of decent living. So he says here, by business, I mean the whole of, of commerce as well as the whole of industry. It's very clear what he is saying. I mean, the wages of a decent living. This was the purpose of the minimum wage. But now it's viewed, you know, over past decades, it's slowly been viewed as, oh, these are just jobs for teens, you know, starting off, they're going to, it's their first job. When that is not the reality, looking at the actual data, and it's also not the reality of what the minimum wage was always supposed to be. All right. There you go. Um, these are, you know, not fluff pieces this week. <laughs> As I said earlier, try to keep it lighter. Actually, where's my chat? There we go. I try to keep it lighter on uh, Fridays, but I don't know. These are stories I wanted to, I wanted to cover, and I was able to luckily prep them all before the show. All right. Um, let me uh, prep the next story here, and I'll be right back.
All right. This story is uh, a Canadian story, but it also shows you the how media frames issues generally when it comes to especially at least media in North America. And uh, sometimes, you know, they do without knowing it. Sometimes it's, it's done intentionally. But regardless, the impact is that people are are uh, informed in a way that makes them think a certain way about labor and large companies. In just another example of how media framing often sides with large corporations and against the average worker, the Toronto Star implicitly blamed striking workers for a potential rise in the price of beef. So it started with this tweet here. And uh, I'll get into the story as well, but this is a series of five tweets. And over these five tweets, they do not mention why this strike is happening. But here's their first tweet that says, a possible strike at one of Canada's largest meat processing plants will almost certainly increase beef prices for consumers on a product that is already prohibitively expensive for a growing number of Canadians. Now, what is this telling the reader? This is communicating that, oh, if the cost of beef increases, then you can blame these striking workers. And over the course of these five tweets, they do not make any different argument. They don't say why they're striking. They don't bring up what I'm going to bring up shortly in terms of profits that are being made and in terms of how they traded workers during the during the uh, pandemic. None of that is brought up. But here, this is, again, another example in how the media frames these issues, whether it's intentional or not. But this is the reality. This, <laughs> Karkle reported, this is... Article from this year, August 6, 2021. Biggest profit in 156-year history. This isn't mentioned in the tweets, isn't mentioned in the piece at all. But instead, they blame the workers. But this is also a, a, uh, a company which counts 14 billionaires. 14 billionaires among its ruling circle. Again, not mentioned in the tweets or in the piece. What they do mention, though, check what they mention here. Cargill is accepting a wage increase for workers, or Cargill accepting a wage increase for workers could also increase the price of beef. <laughs> so it's not enough to blame striking workers for a potential rise in, in the price of beef. You all, They also have to go even further and say, well, if Cargill did give in and increase their wages as one of the uh, things they're calling for, then that may impact... Uh, still impact the price of beef so you can still blame the workers even if this 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 uh this strike uh doesn't go through or if it ends and cargill uh actually gives the workers what they deserve well you can still blame the workers for a rise in the price of beef it is absolutely ridiculous to frame a story this way when this company has made record profits in its entire history here's the graph here record profits in its entire history and it's 14 billionaires in control of the company it's like it's it's freaking unbelievable to me now there's more there's more that of course was not mentioned in the toronto star piece so this is from simon black who is a uh uh let me get his actual title here he's a brock university labor professor so he shares here remarkably the story fails to mention plants had largest covid outbreak linked to a single site in north america 900 plus workers tested positive tragically three died Cargill repeatedly ignored requests from union to discuss health and safety. They also refused union requests to waive sick note requirements and up sanitiza uh, sanita sanitization and decrease line speeds. Waited two days to report first COVID case to union and public health. Ignored union request for two-week closure of plants as cases rose. And Alberta Ministry of Labor greenlit Cargill's uh, health and safety measures. So again, all of this not mentioned in the piece, the piece heavily weighted in favor of this massive corporation and against the workers. And this is a graph I want to bring up here because this is very important, I think, to understanding just the importance of unions when it comes to the working class as a whole. I've referenced this countless times, but I think it, it clearly shows you the importance of, uh, of stronger unions. So this is from the Economic Policy Institute saying here, as union membership declines, income inequality increases. So this is union membership and share of income going to the top 10% 1917 to 2019. You see here as the share of income goes to the top 
union membership declines, or I should say it's the other way around. As union membership declines, the share of income going to the top 10% increases because these two are directly linked. The stronger, the, 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 the more prevalent that strong unions, uh, that there is, but there are strong unions, the more that, that they exist and are, and are pushing labor forward and demanding increases, whether it's in, uh, in wages or in more, you know, healthier and safer environments, the better the working class does and the less that the top 10% make. So it's, this kind of information, this kind of graph, this data, this is what needs to be included in stories like the one in the Toronto Star, because it, that gives you a, a true indication of why we have to be in support of the working class. The whole point of these sorts of papers, of journalism, is to side with the vast majority of people, is to look out for the average person. But what we often see instead is that these Massive media companies are on the side of massive corporations and against the working class. We see this again and again. And again, whether this is done intentionally or not doesn't really matter because th this is the way that things have been done now for, for at least a couple decades in terms of how they frame these stories. So a lot of it, I think, is just unintentional. This is how they view these, these issues. But it also goes into the hiring decisions, who they hire, who they don't hire. And it also just gives you this, this clear indication that there really is not a strong labor voice, at least when it comes to, to mass media. Now, of course, yes, you can pick out story here and there that, that does properly represent the power or, or the, the, the need to have stronger unions. But th those are far and few between. The vast majority of stories are on the side of massive corporations like this and against the working class. All right. This story was so big, I feel like I should have kept it and uh, and done it done it later. Because there's a lot more in this I want to go into. That is just the idea of prepping this all in a day, along with like three other stories, just did not make much sense. But it is what it is. I feel like I, I missed something that I wanted to mention. I don't know. My notes are too long. <laughs> <laughs> that was a big story. All right. Uh, I still have another story coming up. There is no um, wrap up this week. Just didn't have time, but that's fine. A couple of chats here, super chats. Law Gnome says, do you think a bill tying the minimum wage to inflation or to congressional salaries would be more effective? Um, well, Tying it to salaries, I think, <laughs> does make sense. Uh, I haven't heard that floated before, but I think that's... I'm not sure how you would start doing that, but um, considering, you know, how often these people are disconnected from the working class, I think that's actually a good idea. But uh, I'm no expert in terms of, you know, how it should be uh, or what it should be tied to. But on the face of it, I think that it, w it would make sense to tie it to uh, congressional salaries. Riaz Guerrera says, David, I'll pay for the diapers if you promise to be the one who's going to change them. <laughs> are, you my, uh, are you my wife? <laughs> Who wrote that chat? Uh, no, I do change them. I do. Actually, the funny thing is we both of us have to be there for almost every diaper change because he, he rolls around. So like I have to basically be there to hold him down or distract him while he's being changed or vice versa. It's a, a very annoying process right now, but hopefully, you know, he'll grow out of that. All right. Next story coming up. I will uh, be right back.
right. That's the wrong. That's the wrong one. Here we go. <laughs> I just spoiled the next story. Uh, it's going to be a quick stream today. It may be like, I don't know, 40 minutes. Uh, just just the way things went today. I, I think it's largely because I only have four stories, not five. But um, it's because I had three big stories today. But uh, let me grab some chats before I get into this. I want to grab some random chats. Let's see. What are y'all talking about? Uh, Paul Mantella says, I think Dave is kind of a sock dem flirting with actual socialism. Interesting you bring this up. I, uh, so I'm going to be on the, the Crystal and Kyle show. I think the week of Thanksgiving, whenever that is. I'm Canadian, so I don't know when American Thanksgiving is. But um, I think that's when, I'm, when that episode's going to go up. And uh, Kyle asks me like what my... You'll see my answer. But I'll give you a short version here. I'm not anything <laughs> like I don't I there's a reason I don't put a label on myself because I'm focused on what is possible now what can be done now I don't you know if I was focused on you know what's possible in in 20 30 40 50 years then maybe this would be a different channel but because I'm focused on, on the day-to-day -day, what's happening in politics you know in today it doesn't make I don't think it makes sense for me to you know, box myself into a certain perspective. I'm focused on on progress. That's my perspective. So you could say because of the way that things are right now, that I am more of a social democrat because that's essentially the next step. That's what's possible right now. But um, I've discussed worker co-ops. I've discussed uh, this week. I had a story on Portugal and their socialist party, which my understanding is still a, a social democrat party. But um. The Socialist Party passing pro-worker reforms. So I do, you know, dabble, as you say, in socialism and those ideas. But uh, I do want to make sense. Like, I don't do it just for the sake of doing it. I, I Because I covered the day-to-day, -day, I do it where I think it makes sense. Four Walls says, thanks for coming. Thanks for coining the term smug complacency on Canada's COVID-19 government response. D did I did I coin that? <laughs> I feel like that. Did I say that? Well, if I did, then awesome. Yes, I coined the term smug complacency. I'm not even sure if I did that. But anyways, you said on Canada's COVID-19 government response perfectly describes the bumbling Dutch government's approach. Well, there we go. Um, yes, you're welcome. I definitely did that, and it wasn't somebody else. <laughs> Honestly, I don't remember doing that, but maybe I did. I don't know. All right. Let me grab some more. And then I'll do more after this Charlie Kirk... Uh, Charlie Kirk vid. Tyler VG says, I'd say you're a progressive before the meeting got washed out. Yeah, it's unfortunate. The word progressive is just, or the, the label progressive has kind of been screwed with a million times over. Um, but when I say it, I mean progress. I guess you could take that anyway as well. <laughs> it's not all that descriptive either. But progress in terms of what is possible now, like moving into a direction that is uh, beneficial to those that are at the bottom of society. That's my perspective. That's, uh, that's what I bring to the table. All right. A random critic says, thinking about the judge in Rittenhouse case, is it that he is truly in belief of innocence until proven guilty, or do you believe he is biased? That's from, did I say your name? Random critic. Um, no, he's biased. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> like, yesterday, I think it was yesterday, or maybe it was today. At, at the beginning, at the be before anything happened, they had no... It, it, it was yesterday. He had a a, a round of applause for um, anybody who was a, a a veteran, and of course, the defense's witness was a veteran, <laughs> like the next guy that was going to go up in the stand. So everybody had to applause, had to give a round of applause for uh, the the next witness for the defense, like <laughs> shit like that. And then I, as I went into it in my recent video, there's been uh, he threw out three different. Uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for here? Three different 
like examples of Kyle Rittenhouse and and his uh, his mindset before the shooting. Threw them all out, including one where two weeks before he had said on a in a taped conversation as he was watching people in a CVS, he said that he wished he had his AR so he could shoot them. Uh, so like shit like that, and then and then at the same time, you can't call the victims victims, which that's apparently normal or not normal, but but that's it it has been done before in a self defense case as it sort of weighs it against the self-defense case, if you call them victims. But, so that part's fine. But it's, but the judge also ruled, but you can call them looters, arsonists, and another word. So, like, you can you can claim that these people who were killed were looters uh, and arsonists, even though they were not convicted of that, but you can't call them victims. So, you know, again and again, and then you see his behavior th- throughout... Uh, the uh, various testimonies where he interrupts the prosecutor a number of times, um, argues with him, claims that you can't use a certain video that they were using because if you zoom in, it adds pixels, <laughs> which doesn't make any sense. But he's claiming it's like altering the footage. If you zoom into the footage, it's adding pixels. So again and again, he has shown his his bias in favor of uh, in favor of the defense. Louis de Noya says, keep up the good work. Thank you. Thank you. All right, let's get to this next one, then I'll grab some some more random chats. And super chats, if you're feeling so inclined. Okay. Nope. Again, wrong. I am just off today. <laughs> Something's going on. I think I just worked too damn hard. I need like a, I need like a, a full week, just a week off. The issue with that, though, is I come back and I don't know what the hell's going on. Then I have to catch up and work harder to catch up. It's just not even worth it. All right. Charlie Kirk. Charlie. Charlie Kirk. Conservative propagandist Charlie Kirk went on his show and made this claim. Now, what he's saying here is true, though it's not clear why he's saying it. But after the clip, I will show you why it makes perfect sense. The country, being an American, 15% of millennials say they are proud to be an American. 15% say they are proud to be an American. As I mentioned, one third of millennials describe themselves as being LGBTQ, 39%. 39%. It's three times the proportion identified among the combined older adults in a generation. This is the gayest generation in American history. And that's not a slur, by the way. It's not a slander. It's just the way it is. Someone's going to say, oh, that's, that's a pejorative. They're the gayest generation in American history. It's what the study says. All right. Now, he's not wrong. But why? <laughs> why did he feel the need to bring that up? unless he was trying to elicit some kind of negative response from his audience. It's really odd to me, but there are people that are wondering, why is this happening? Why are so many kids gay? <laughs> why are they, or why are people part of the LGBT community? Why are people more, more willing? I mean, this, this kind of gives it away. Why are people more willing to be themselves? That's really what you should be asking. So this is a graph that I've shared before in other contexts when it came to, um, I think I was discussing trans rights at the time, but this tells you the whole thing. The history of left-handedness. So the rate of left-handedness among Americans by year of birth. So you see here, used to be very unpopular to be left-handed. Whether it was, you know, teachers smacking you in the hand to make you right, right-handed because you were possessed by the devil or whatever the hell <laughs> the excuse was at the time. But as that stigma went away, See, about a solid 12% of people are left-handed. That was always the number. But it was just, at one time, low because people were not, they were afraid to admit they were left-handed or they were, it was beaten out of them. It's the exact same thing with the LGBT community, uh, community today. People are now more willing to explore their sexuality, to actually be who they are. They're 
less afraid than they once were because it's become normalized to be who you are and explore that. So anyone wondering why <laughs> there is a massive increase in the amount of people that are part of the LGBTQ community, that is the reason. The stigma has gone away. People can be themselves and they are no longer afraid. There you go. Very quick story. I think this is uh, hopefully one that people can easily share around just to understand, especially the older folks. Help them understand why things are the way they are and why it's nothing to be scared of. But there you go. All right, let me grab... This is a, a very quick stream today. So I'm going to grab some chats, more chats, and uh, let's just, let's have a conversation, shall we? Maybe even clips and stuff that come up. I don't know. Still alive. Super chat. Very generous super chat, sir. Um, says, you know, Thunderfoot here on YouTube. I do not. He just released a new video exploring a possible new sodium-based fuel source that can potentially reverse the effects of CO2 in our atmosphere. Thought you and others here should see it. I don't know anything about this. Um, let me just save that name. I'll just look into this. I feel like, though, if this is true, then wouldn't this be, like, breaking news? Massive news that we all know about. But I'll look into it. Uh, don't be hating says message retracted, but thank you for the donation. Harry says the ironic thing is that ide ideologues like Charlie Kirk are responsible for the general public's distaste of patriotism. He can blame himself for that. I hear that. Jenna Beck, thank you for your super chat as well. All right. Um, also, of course, I'll take any more super chats that come in, but let me grab some, uh, randos. Or is, or is the, the real term that I've coined, normies. I was the first one to say normie. No one else said it before me. That's not true either. <laughs> I don't think I've coined any term in my life. But I'm glad, uh, I'm glad some people think I did. All right. Let's grab some randoms. Um, Paul Mantella says, what are your thoughts on r slash anti-work? So I read it community called anti-work. I don't know anything about this, this page, so I cannot share my opinion. Also, yeah, if you want me to see your chat, the best way is to tag my uh, username in it. So it highlights. Let me scroll up. Tyler VG says cops should be beholden to the people, not unions. John Deere and Kellogg are not consequential to the mass like police. 100% completely agree. This is why um, police unions are not looked at the same way as unions generally, because they are essentially, you know, the right hand to, uh, to the state, which in this case is owned by massive corporations. So, um, yeah, it's a very different, very different dynamic than say, you know, like a teacher's union or something. Danny Leon says, have you peeped the Jimmy Dore drama? <laughs> oh, have I peeped? I have, I have definitely peeped. Um, I'm not going to do a video because I feel, you know, maybe I'll start doing videos on this shit. But at this point, I hope it's obvious. Like, God damn. <laughs> how much more do you have to see to realize this dude's not on the left? Um, but I imagine you're, uh, you're referencing the fact that he recently was caught changing the text of an article to make it anti-vax when the article was not anti-vax. He, uh, came out recently. Ken Klippenstein posted this. And um, blamed his, I'm not going to play the video, but he blamed his producer. And uh, 
Uh, you know what? Sure, I'll play the video. Whatever. <laughs> Let's watch this video. When we originally reported this... Hold up. I'm hearing it twice. When we originally reported this, this graphic here is incorrect. This graphic here was put together by my producer, and he joined together two sentences that didn't go together, and he added a word, despite... So if you're going to add a word, you have to put brackets around it so people know you've added a word and it wasn't in the source text. He didn't do that. And then he changed the tense of these two words to make it fit syntactically or grammatically with the rest of the sentence. Now, you could combine two sentences, but you have to put a dot, 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 and then so people know that you've, you're, you're jumping ahead. And so, but that didn't do that. Plus, that was supposed to be a period, and he put a comma. That, and then he put this, and it actually changed the meaning of this sentence. Uh, it, it, it didn't mean what... Th so, Anti by the way, doesn't change. So I have to cover that, right, because that was fucked up. And I didn't know about that. I had to trust my producer that we went over the story. He put it together. I had no idea he was going to take two sentences, jam them together, and add a word without putting it in a bracket. So I had no idea when I did this, uh, this segment originally that that had happened. Now, obviously, I don't know if he's telling the truth. I don't know if his producer or it was him or it was his other producer, which is his wife. Uh, but regardless, I don't know, maybe read the article, <laughs> like, maybe do, I don't, do a little reading, understand that this is, I think this is what likely happened because this is the content that he was looking for. Some anti-vax content. That's the lens he has on everything. That That's the pressure. I imagine again, speculation on my part here, but I imagine that's the pressure he put on his, if this, if what he's saying is true, that's the pressure he put on the people that work for him to find information that, that essentially bolsters the argument that he is trying to make, the anti-vax argument. So that's why, if this happened, this producer felt pressured to manipulate this article to the point where it was saying something that, that it was not actually saying. So, it, and then, yeah, to, to just completely blame your producer, apparently he's fired that producer now. I imagine that guy has some real stories, <laughs> some really good stories. I would love to hear them, what it was like working there, apparently, uh, we've heard from others that have worked with Jimmy at TYT. He uh, is not a nice guy to work with. So I am very curious to hear if that producer is real for him to uh, tell his story, because I would love to hear what it was like working there. But this is just one piece of a much larger video. So I'm going to share this. I watched this video uh, last weekend. It's 50 minutes long, so it's substantial, but it is deep. Like, it is well-researched. It goes very deep into not just that one example, but many examples of how Jimmy has manipulated content to be anti-vax because he sees that it benefits him for him to be, see, he started off doing pro vax stuff as you, these are some of the articles here and then, um, changed it to do anti-vax stuff. And they're all over a hundred thousand views. Like you see that the, the desire here, here, you know, he's doing okay. 50 K 87 K 150. But then the anti-vax stuff, we're talking 181, 128, 132, 390, 170. They're all over 100,000. Some are over 200,000. So this is, some people get ca ca caught up in this, where it is the, this, what's called audience capture, where Mike Figueredo talked about this when I was, um, when me and him were on the show with Progressive Voice on, on his channel. And uh, it's, it's this thing where you see what your audience likes and you just feed them that content. It takes, you know, you have to have actual principles and a, a stance on these issues and actually caring about progress to put out information that may not always be beneficial to your viewers. Like recently, the Chappelle stuff. I got a lot of downvotes on my comments on Chappelle, even though, I'm, if you watch those videos, I am super fair to Chappelle. Like, it, it's not, like, I don't say he has bad intent. It's really just like a certain portion of the special that's that's uh, that there's that there's issues, but um, still down votes, a lot of bad reaction. But I, I did like three more videos after that with the same perspective because I don't I don't care if my audience hates it. If you're wrong, you're wrong. If I know I'm correct and on the right side of history, that I'm on the right side of history, I'm going to keep saying that. I'm going to try and, and I'm going to try and communicate it in different ways to try and educate you. 
So I'm not going to just, you know, give in to an audience or to, uh, to people on certain issues where they think they're right. And, and I know I'm, I'm correct. So I'm going to stick to that, that position, regardless of where the audience is, but some people chase the views. And I think that's what happened here. So Sean did check out his channel, just simply Sean, fantastic, uh, video here. Great breakdown of the whole situation. Back to the chat. Um, Nanette Snowden says, love your perspective on both U.S. and Canadian politics. Please talk about health care mandated slash lack thereof. Do you mean like in terms of, what do you mean health care mandated? Like Medicare for all? So I, back during the Democratic primary, I talked a lot about healthcare and the difference between the Canadian healthcare system and the American system, but I'll just, I'll briefly refresh some of that stuff again, if that's what you're talking about, I assume. Um, basically, as a Canadian with healthcare guaranteed to me, I never think about healthcare until I need it. So there's no dealing with, you know, insurance companies, no seeing if this is covered, that's covered. It's, it's not on your mind at all. Unless you're, you know, you have to go to the hospital or you have to see a doctor. And I don't like it's, it's hard for me to sometimes think about what to discuss because it's, for me, it's just in the back of my mind all the time. It's not something I'm, I'm really thinking about. But so I have to always think about, you know, if I'm in the US, how would my experience be different? So for example, if I want to see a doctor, I have my, my family doctor, but if she isn't available, I can see, I can go to any walk-in clinic. Go to any walk-in clinic and see a doctor there. And that's, you walk in, you show your health card, you walk out, that's it. There's nothing else to do. There's nothing. That's, that's it. That's a whole, that's the whole process. When it comes to a, uh, a surgery, I had surgery once. It was a minor surgery. It wasn't life or death. So it was planned ahead of time. Minor surgeries are the only times where there's really wait time, uh, like serious wait time. So I had to wait three months for this minor surgery but it was no big deal since it wasn't, it wasn't a serious issue. So I waited three months, had the surgery, went to the hospital, <laughs> was put under, woke up, left. Like that was the whole process. That's it. So it, I, like, it's, it's very streamlined, I guess is the best way to describe it. Describing the difference. It's, it's just, uh, I don't know. It's something that's, you just take for granted. And when it comes to now, there are definite gaps in our healthcare system in Canada. So if I'm talking to a Canadian audience, then I'm going to be a lot more critical of our healthcare in terms of there need to be more funding in certain areas. So pharmacare is not universal, dental care, not universal. So we have certain serious gaps in our healthcare system. Long-term care is, is like, a, is largely private, but there's some public money put into it, but it's largely privatized. So there are serious issues with our healthcare system that is not a fault of the single payer aspect of it. It's simply a fault of certain things not being covered and they're, they're not being enough funding into them. So, it, and that's where we lose out to countries in Europe or places like even the UK that have the, the NHS, a national healthcare system that is different than a single payer system. But um, generally, yeah, like compared to the US, it's clearly night and day. Healthcare costs don't bankrupt people. Nobody, you know, dies due to a lack of access to healthcare that isn't a thing. So meanwhile, bankruptcy, uh, medical bankruptcy is the most common form of bankruptcy in the U.S. Again, doesn't really exist in Canada. So yeah, it's, it's just a, it's a night and day situation. Don't be hating says trying this again, LOL, but I appreciate your fresh Canadian perspective as it keeps me passionate in my work slash education in SW. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, don't be. <laughs> All right. Um, I did not get to see all the reactions to uh, the Jimmy comments. I'm sure there were many. <laughs> but um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I think certain things are just like obvious on their face. If, if you follow... If you follow it enough or followed him enough, it's clear what happened. Like it, the change has been maybe gradual, but at some point you have to wake up. Jeremy Gunn says, how do you feel about the 
the EBB being changed to 30 bucks. I don't know what the EBB is. What's EBB? I have no idea. I will look for follow-ups to know what you're talking about. But considering I don't know what has been changed to $30, I, I, I probably don't know what you're talking about anyways. <clears throat> Um, let's see here. Thomas Gordon says, I'm a Canadian, been on a list for a family doctor for three years. That's a large gap. Yeah, when it, certain, so to be clear, you can still see a doctor, but uh, at a walk-in clinic. So yes, when it comes to cert, certain areas, um, there is a lack of family doctors for sure. That definitely is a problem. Um, but that doesn't mean you're going to die. Like if you have, if you, I don't know, get into a car accident or, ha or need major surgery for some, or get cancer, you're going to be treated and you're going to be taken care of. So I understand. Yes. Uh, again, as I said, there were issues in our system, but compared to the U S system, when you're making that comparison, there's, there are likely weights for family doctors in, in the U S too, I imagine, but unless you have money. So this is the, the other big difference here in the, um, in the, uh, the U S system healthcare is rash. It is still rationed. Like they talk about rationing in, in universal systems or Medicare or, or single payer systems, but there's rationing in the American system. The American system is rationed based on money. If you're wealthy, you're fine. You got no issues. So if you're a wealthy American, you likely have a great experience with your healthcare system because you don't have to worry about anything, but the vast majority of people don't experience that. Rationing in in universal systems is based on need. So again, when it comes to surgery, if you need a life or death surgery, you're going to get that surgery. If you have a minor surgery, then you're going to be able to wait. You're going to have to wait in most cases for uh, various minor surgeries. But again, there's still wait lists in the U.S. as well. So the, the idea that there's no waiting in the American system, I guess if you're very wealthy, there's no waiting. But if you're most people, they're still waiting. So it, that argument's always been really weird to me, like the, the wait list argument. Waiting still exists in the U.S. Just, you know, if you're super wealthy, I guess you can jump the line. But otherwise, uh, there's not much difference there. Jeremy Gunn is talking about the, the emergency broadband benefit. I don't know about this change, so I, I cannot comment. But I appreciate it, Jeremy, for uh, for raising this issue. I will look more into this. All right, probably gonna jump off shortly, but uh, let me grab some more chats. This is the part of this stream I enjoy the most. Maybe I should just do like live streams, just doing chats. Makes more sense to me. Doug Grinberg says CNN federal grand jury in, indicts former Trump advisor Steve Bannon for contempt of Congress. Is this an update to that story? I'll have to look more into that after. But uh, yeah, that guy's a piece of crap. So look at that. Look at that. Let's check this out. A federal grand jury has returned an indictment against former Trump advisor Steve Bannon for contempt of Congress, the Justice Department announced on Friday. Merrick Garland has been under tremendous political pressure to indict Bannon since the House referred the Trump ally to the Justice Department for contempt on October 21st. I gotta say, 
you know, I'm not an expert in this field particularly, but I, I've seen people who are experts in this. And uh, yeah, Garland is a, is, has been terrible. I mean, just do, do the bare minimum when it comes to the Trump administration and, uh, and all the shit they engaged in that has been well documented through both um, uh, investigations and, and publicly. And, you know, the guy is uh, clearly, clearly not doing what he can, but that may also be the fault of Biden who, you know, may not want him to go as far as he could. But anyways, I'm not going to read this all here, but uh, good to, uh, good to see some progress there. Not that I've covered this or followed this all that closely. All right. Rad Zoso says, did you see the video Kyle posted about his ER visit? Very eye-opening. Yes, I did watch that. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, ERs generally are a horrible place to be. But um, no, his... Yeah, hearing about, you know, a firsthand experience in a situation like that, uh, it was wild. New member... Des Denova, thank you for becoming a member. Mike H says, did you see the Jacobin slash YouGov study on working class political messaging? If you haven't, you really should cover it. It's very important to progressive coalition building. I saw, I actually saw some takedowns of uh, their methodology and how they came to that data. Um, I didn't look into it all that you know, deeply because I didn't really care. But I don't know. Like, I think that my understanding was that they were trying to claim that, I don't know, that they, that any focus on like social issues is like a negative. But in terms of working class, they only... I forget what it was now, but their their definition of working class apparently was not what the working class actually is in terms of who they who they polled in in that study. So, uh, but again, I don't have it in front of me, so I can't tell you for sure. But if you look into that, that apparently was the issue with that with that study or with that poll. But I don't know. I don't know. All right. Almost going to get off. What is your favorite color? Says John Richard. Green. Green is my favorite color. All right. All right. That's enough. That's enough. Had a good time today. Oh, here we go. Typical Canadian says, any final comment on... This is my last comment. Any final comment on the soon-to-be-departed Green Party leader in Canada? Good riddance. Thank goodness. Finally, she's actually resigned. She's She resigned at the end of September, then claimed she didn't resign, or it wasn't finalized yet. And But then this week, she sent... She formally resigned, is my understanding. I hope for good this time. <laughs> Just the absolute, uh, a horrible leader. That said, I'm objective. She did, a, I think, did a solid job in the debates. But, you know, that's not going to do much for you when the rest of what you're doing is, is just garbage. So uh, good to see that she is gone. I'm hoping that Dimitri Lascaris runs again. He came in second last time. I interviewed him on the show last year during that leadership uh, race. And uh, I think if he, if he runs again, he's got a, a solid shot at, uh, at winning it. All right. All right. We good. That's good. Uh, all right. <laughs> I'm just, <laughs> I'm thinking about that the weekend's here, but the reality is I have to do some shit this weekend, so I don't even really get a break, unfortunately. That said, though, thank you all for showing up. And uh, I will see you all again 
next week. Goodbye. <laughs>